Okay, welcome to today's webinar. This is Susan Nisley at the Nebraska Library Commission, and this session is an introduction to the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries uh, collection and uh, group purchase. Uh, we have done training on Overdrive in the past, and in the I used to always uh, try to do a training session when we had new members join, but uh, we haven't uh, had a large group of new members uh, in the near in the recent future. So it's been a while since I've done an online training session, and we wanted to go ahead and provide updated information and also uh, do some. Uh, Get a recording up there that's more current. I think the uh, previous uh, training that we have online as a recording is a couple years old, so this should give us a good chance to uh, reach out to uh, new librarians who have uh, recently started working at uh, libraries that belong to the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries Group and also get, uh, like I said, updated information out there. Um, in today's session, uh, I want to give you background information on the group as a whole. I want to talk a little bit about the history of how we got started, how we funded the group. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we do collection development. I want to give you some background information on some of the licensing models that we have to work with. Um, and the reason I want to give you this background information is because sometimes it's really helpful to have it when you are talking to patrons. Not every patron conversation requires you to know all of this background information, but sometimes if they have a question or a comment or, or a complaint about the way things are, if you know some of the background information and can share that with them, it sometimes helps them understand and not feel as put out by something that perhaps bothers them. It gives them a little bit of understanding if you can give them that background information. I'm also going to review the circulation policies that the group has decided upon. We're going to talk a little bit about file formats because that's important in terms of choosing which titles to check out. And then we're going to go and move on to the site demo. So I hope that we'll at least have half an hour for the site demo so we'll see how we move through the material. So to start out, um, just to give you background information, the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries Group is a group of Nebraska libraries that join together with support from the Nebraska Library Commission to share the cost of offering an Overdrive downloadable uh, audiobook ebook collection uh, to uh, their patrons, Nebraska citizens or residents. Um, one of the reasons that we had to band together is because uh, the, in the cost of setting up an overdrive collection, the initial setup costs uh, are or were, still are, quite high. Uh, it, it was really uh, too much for any one uh, library to uh, bear by themselves, the two exceptions being Lincoln City Libraries in Nebraska and Omaha Public Library. Um, both of those uh, libraries have their own overdrive collections, which they actually got set up and running before our Nebraska Overdrive Libraries group got, got set up and running. Um, a group of libraries first started talking about uh, trying to get together and uh, work as a group to get access to downloadable digital audiobooks in December of 2006. Um, it took quite a while to uh, decide how to proceed to come up with some models that we thought would work, and it wasn't until March 2008 that the group and the site actually uh, went live. So when we first started, uh, went live in March 2008, the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries Group uh, had 25 member libraries. At that time, we were just buying downloadable audiobooks. Um, I think ebooks were available, but at that time, they weren't the uh, hot items that they are today, and so we did uh, our initial goal was to uh, have a collection of downloadable audiobooks. So uh, we started with 496 downloadable audiobooks. As you can imagine, within a day or so, all of those books were checked out. So we had 25 member libraries, 496 audiobooks, almost all of which were checked out that first uh, week or so. So that was a little dicey. Um, 
We continued to uh, focus on audiobooks uh, exclusively until July 2010, and at that point we did start buying ebooks. Uh, I like to mention this because um, a number of libraries have joined after uh, July 2010, and so some of them actually aren't even aware. Uh, some of them over the years I've discovered that they weren't even really that aware of the fact that the group uh, purchased audiobooks as well or that we initially started with audiobooks. So we've had some libraries, uh, you know, talk about the fact that they're not interested in audiobooks at all. They don't necessarily want the budget to go to audiobooks, um, not necessarily realizing that um, the initial purpose of the group was audiobooks, and we actually had, especially those initial libraries, they really built up a large population of audiobook users in that um, initial uh, two-year period where we only purchased audiobooks. So we now do purchase both audiobooks and ebooks. Um, so that's sometimes helpful to remember that we started out with audiobooks and then we added ebooks. Uh, today, we have 170 member libraries participating. Uh, all but one of those libraries are public libraries. Uh, one of our initial 25 members was a school library, and they sort of got in, and they were kind of grandfathered in. Subsequently, Overdrive stopped allowing uh, school libraries to participate in what they considered a public library consortium. So we do have one school library that was uh, grandfathered in. We uh, These 170 libraries serve a population of over 680,000. So uh, you can see this group uh, serves um, a third of the population in Nebraska. Um, and uh, the other portions of the population largely are served by uh, Omaha Public Library and Lincoln City Library. So we do... Uh, a large uh, percentage of the population in Nebraska does have access to an overdrive collection, whether through Lincoln City Libraries, Omaha Public Library, or uh, through the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries group. Today, we have over 9,000 audiobook titles in our collection and over 21,000 ebooks in our collection. So we have grown uh, immeasurably since we started out with those 496 audiobooks. To give you a little bit of background on funding, uh, and this sort of uh, gives you uh, an idea of what I mean when I said the initial setup costs were uh, too great for uh, many of our Nebraska libraries to bear on their own outside of a group setting. The initial cost to uh, create the group website was $28,000, and so the Nebraska Library Commission did pick up that initial $28,000 investment. There's also an annual maintenance fee that has to be paid to Overdrive, and initially that was $12,000 per year, um, and it remained steady at that rate uh, through 2015. Uh, in 2016, we started a new five-year contract, and that does build in a $2,000 uh, annual increase to that maintenance fee. So this uh, past year, we paid $14,000. Uh, next year, we'll pay $16,000, et cetera. Uh, that maintenance fee is also something that the Nebraska Library Commission pays for and has has sort of taken that on as our, one of our uh, contributions to the group. Uh, the nice thing about the Library Commission being able to pay the maintenance fee is that then all of the money that you contribute annually through paying your annual participation fee, that all goes into our collection development pot. Um, each of your libraries pays either uh, 10 cents per population served or uh, a minimum of $500 uh, to participate. When we add all of those contributions together, that comes this past this for this upcoming year. Um, we just finished the renewal uh, period where people re-upped for the next year. Um, for this coming year, we've got $119,445 in our collection development pot contributed by member libraries. Um, the past couple of years, we've also gotten um, special appropriations from the legislature. Uh, 
the legislature set aside some money for what they call Nebraska e-reads. Um, and this is uh, to, it's administered by the Nebraska Library Commission and the intent is to make uh, ebooks and audiobooks available uh, statewide. And so we do that by splitting funds uh, proportionally based on PopServe between the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries Group, um, Omaha Public Library, and Lincoln City Libraries. Um, the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries portion of eReads funding for this upcoming year is $94,000. And so when you add that to uh, your contributions to the group, collection development budget that brings us up to $214,000 for uh, purchasing books from October 1st, 2016 through to September 30th, 2017. And one of the things I like to uh, mention to people is that um, $500 is a big amount of money for libraries with small budgets. And so sometimes you do get pushback from uh, your uh, funding sources, your library board, or your uh, city. Uh, one of the things that I think might be helpful is to say we contribute $500, but it gives us, basically it gives us access to $214,000 of buying power and content. Um, and that's just new content in this upcoming year, and that doesn't count for all of the uh, content purchased in the past that's still in the collection. So you're getting access to $214,000 of buying power during this next year. So that's just kind of a helpful way to talk about it with um, people who might question uh, spending money to, to belong to the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries group. So um, if you haven't been a member of the group for a long time, you might not have ha heard a lot of discussion about how we do collection development. Um, we have, uh, basically we have two volunteer selectors from member libraries who've been purchasing or making purchase suggestions or selections for us for some time. Um, our primary uh, purchaser or selector for adult fiction is Mary Jo Mack. She's the director of this John Stahl Library in West Point, and you've got her email address up on the screen. And then uh, Karen Drevo from Norfolk Public Library purchases adult nonfiction titles and juvenile uh, and young adult titles. Um, the reason we have limited purchasing uh, permission to two people is just to make it easier with 170 uh, libraries. Um, it would be hard to manage collection development with uh, more people involved. We know a lot of people uh, would be afraid to log into the administrative module if they thought that they might accidentally uh, purchase something. And so we, we have limited purchase permissions for the group to uh, these two individuals. Uh, other people with per purchase permissions uh, include me and Devra Dragos, who's the director of my department at the Nebraska Library Commission. And Devra actually goes in on a pretty regular basis and she checks holds um, and she, you know, if, if there's a lot of holes on a title, she'll purchase additional copies of a title. If uh, we've gotten some suggestions, she'll purchase uh, suggestions that we've received from patrons or librarians. And um, we also always kind of try to be on the lookout. Uh, sometimes we have some books in a series and other books in the series haven't been available to purchase through Overdrive. And so she keeps an eye out often to see if additional uh, series titles have become available so that we can fill in gaps in series. Uh, even though we've limited purchase permissions, we definitely want everyone to feel like they can make suggestions. So uh, you've got Mary Jo's email address, Karen uh, Drevo's email address. Uh, you can email uh, suggestions to them of titles you're interested in having added to the collection. You can also contact me and Devra with suggestions. Um, you can also get into the Overdrive Marketplace, which is what I'm going to talk about in the November Overdrive session. Uh, so you could actually search and see uh, what titles are potentially available to purchase for our collection. And so we'll talk about how you can do that if you really want to be able to get in there and see if a title is available uh, before you make a suggestion. So that's something we'll uh, talk about in November in more depth. To give you some idea about how we uh, sort of divvy up our collection development budget, 
uh, for the last couple of years, we've gone with a 50-50 uh, split between audiobooks and ebooks. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that audiobooks on average cost more than ebooks. I double checked and the average cost of an audiobook uh, is $55. The average cost of an ebook is $22. So we have 50% of our budget for audiobooks because they're more expensive. That means we don't buy as many audiobooks as we do ebooks. Um, Within each of those two budget categories, audiobook and ebook, we uh, further uh, divide the funds uh, as follows. Adult fiction, we spend about 50%, 57% of our budget on adult fiction, 20% on adult nonfiction, and 23% on juvenile young adult titles. And uh, now comes content licensing models, and this information is just good to have in the back of your mind uh, so that sometimes uh, sometimes it comes in handy when you're talking to patrons and they're asking why, uh, you know, why we don't have more copies of a particularly popular title or um, why a title hasn't been purchased or uh, why a title that used to be available is no longer available. When we first started buying audiobooks and then ebooks from Overdrive, all the titles we purchased were available on a one copy, one user uh, model. And that's just like print. It means if the group, the consortium owns one copy of a title, then one person can have it checked out at a time. If someone else is interested in that title that's checked out, they'd have to place a hold on it. If we want more than one person to be able to uh, have that title checked out at one time, then we'd have to purchase uh, more than one copy of that title. So one book, one user. Uh, once we'd purchase a copy uh, under this licensing model, we would own it essentially forever, um, as long as it's available through the service. So, uh, and for the most part, that's been true. So buy it once and you have access forever. Almost all the audiobooks in our collection are available under this licensing model. The only exception um, are the Harry Potter titles, which we purchased. Uh, they were only offered on a, um, you purchase a copy and it's available for five years. So with that exception, all audiobooks are purchased uh, under one copy, one user licensing model. And right now about 70% of the eBooks in our collection uh, were purchased under this, this model. Starting in 2011, we suddenly had a uh, publisher, HarperCollins, that decided they were no longer comfortable with that one uh, copy, one user perpetual access model. And so they decided that they were only going to make their books available um, using a 26 checkout uh, metered access model. So we'd buy a book from HarperCollins. Uh, it could be checked out 26 times, and at that point, the book expired, and if we wanted uh, to continue to have access to it, we'd have to purchase another copy. Um, initially, that was uh, very unpopular. Librarians were very unhappy about that. Um, our unhappiness didn't make any difference, though. HarperCollins didn't reconsider. Um, since then, that actual, actually, that 26 checkouts model uh, is not looking so bad because of some of the other licensing models that have been introduced. Uh, Simon & Schuster uh, makes books available for 12 months, and after 12 months, uh, they expire. Uh, this is really frustrating because it might mean that a book uh, is only checked out 10 or 11 times, um, and then if it doesn't get, if you know, once that year is up, uh, your access is over and you have to decide whether to purchase it or not. Um, and so that's why sometimes, uh, you know, we, we don't choose to repurchase a title uh, if it hasn't circulated a lot um, and if it's fairly expensive. Um, Scholastic makes books available for 24 months and then they expire. Macmillan has a model that says the earlier of 52 checkouts are 24 months. So, um, you know, if a book 
gets checked out 52 times uh, in 15 months, it then uh, is no longer available. Or um, if it's not checked out 52 times, it goes away after 24 months regardless. Uh, Penguin Publishing Group, uh, for quite some time, they made books available for a 12-month time period, and then they expired. Uh, they subsequently switched to a one-copy, one-user model, but when they did that, they increased their prices quite a bit. So again, this makes decisions about whether to purchase titles, whether to repurchase titles, a little bit more difficult. If a title is really inexpensive and you only, only have access to it for 12 months, um, you don't necessarily mind buying a copy if it's $6.99 and you get access for 12 months and, you know, uh, that that's uh, not too hard of a decision to make. But if it costs a lot more and you're only going to have access to it uh, if it's a lot more and it's not a popular book, then it may be a little harder to make that decision. Um, so again, that gives you a little bit of background information on why sometimes we may choose not to repurchase a title. It also is something to keep in mind. We have, because we purchased some of these uh, time metered titles in the past, uh, we've got we do have some titles that are disappearing from our collection every couple of days. So we kind of have a, which makes it really hard from a statistics point of view too. Um, you know, anytime you say how many titles do you have in your collection, it's kind of a moving target because we have titles that are expiring, uh, new titles being added. Uh, just as a review, uh, and these are decisions that our group made as a whole by a majority vote. Um, currently, uh, we limit patrons to checking out six titles at a time. When we first started out uh, back in 2008, patrons could only check out three titles at a time. Uh, at one point along the way, we increased that to four titles, and now we are at six titles. Uh, we've also limited people to only being able to put three titles on hold at one time. Um, and this is, of course, does frustrate people. But on the other hand, one of the biggest complaints we get from patrons is that hold lists are so long. So many titles uh, are checked out and have lots of holes on them that frustrates them. And so we want to do something to make people a little bit judicious about which titles they put holes on so that people aren't frustrated any more than they have to be by long hold lists. As far as how long a patron can have an item checked out, um, there is some flexibility. We've set it up so that when a patron first uh, logs into their account, if they don't make any changes, the default checkout period for ebooks and audiobooks is both 14 days. But patrons can go in and make some adjustments to their own personal default uh, checkout periods. Audiobooks, they have two choices. They can choose seven days or 14 days. And ebooks, they can choose 7, 14, or 21 days. And I will show you where to get in uh, and change those settings uh, in an individual account. Um, you'll also see in that little uh, screenshot at the bottom of the page, it says Die for Her. This shows uh, right before a patron would click on the borrow, uh, borrow uh, button, it does uh, give them an option to change the checkout time if they're logged into their account. So there's kind of a reminder of what their default checkout period is for the title, and there's a little change link that they can click on if they want to change the checkout period um, within uh, options provided um, at the time of checkout. <clears throat> I want to say just a little bit about DRM because I'm going to reference it in the next couple of slides when we talk about file format. Uh, DRM stands for Digital Rights Management, and it's basically a technology that controls or limits what you can do with a digital media file. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that there are different flavors or brands of DRM, and that sometimes has implications for uh, 
what you can do with particular files and which sorts of devices and computers you can download a particular file to. So I want to review file formats available uh, for ebooks first. Um, probably the most popular file format and the file format that the majority of ebooks in OverDrive are available in is EPUB. Uh, the nice thing about EPUB uh, file format is that it has reflowable text and so um, lines are going to break in an appropriate place regardless of whether you're on a full-size computer screen or whether you're on a cell phone and have a small screen. The text is going to adjust and uh, be readable on either uh, type of screen. Um, EPUB files can be downloaded to a computer that has Adobe Digital Editions free software on it. It can also be downloaded to a mobile device like a phone or a tablet using the OverDrive app. EPUB files can be protected with Adobe DRM and the majority of ebooks available through the OverDrive collection are protected using Adobe DRM and so those will be referred to as Adobe EPUB files. Uh, EPUB files can be DRM free also and those are referred to as open EPUB files and you will occasionally find a title that is, is available in that open EPUB format in OverDrive. Another file format you'll see occasionally is PDF. Some of the titles are available in PDF. Um, this is going to be uh, most valuable when you're talking about a book where a static layout is important. So if you've got lots of charts or diagrams or images, that static layout's going to be important. The limitation of PDF is that you can't really easily resize the, the screen. Uh, you can zoom in or out, but if you're on a small device, that's not going to work well. And in, and in fact, um, the OverDrive app, if you if you need to use the OverDrive app on a mobile device like a phone, that does not support downloading PDF. Um, usually you would uh, use a PDF if you're on a computer and you can download it to Adobe Digital Editions. Again, PDF files can be protected with Adobe DRM or they can be DRM free, in which case they're referred to as open PDF. There are two additional file formats you will run across. Kindle is one format, and one thing that's important about this is OverDrive is really, as far as I know, the only sort of ebook service provider to libraries that was able to get, uh, get access to and, and provide books in Kindle format. Uh, so they are unique that way. Um, people who have Kindle devices like an e Kindle e-reader, like a paper white, they can only read books on that device that are available in Kindle format. And so you're going to have a set, subset of your population that needs to make sure that a book's available in Kindle format before they can check it out from OverDrive and use it. Uh, I'd say a majority of our e-books are available in Kindle format, but not all of them. And so that's something I'm going to show you how to kind of keep an eye out for when we're looking at the actual interface. Uh, so Kindle format books are uh, required if you've got a Kindle e-reader, but they can also be uh, read if you've got a Kindle app uh, on uh, a tablet or a phone. The Kindle uh, fi file format is protected by an Amazon uh, proprietary DRM, and so those uh, files will have a file format uh, suffix of AZW. Finally, there's a format called OverDrive Read, and this is something that OverDrive introduced to try to make uh, access to the ebook content easier. Uh, OverDrive Read format ebooks can be read immediately via a current web browser on your computer or mobile device. They require no additional software, so you don't have to have the OverDrive app or a Kindle app or anything like that. You don't need to, so you don't need to download additional software or activate it with um, any sort of ID. 
The nice thing about OverDrive read books is you can save them or download them to your cache and bookmark them and then have access to that text when you're offline. So if uh, you don't have, if you know you're going to be someplace and you don't have um, internet access, but you need to use that OverDrive read format, you can still often um, take advantage of an offline reading option. There's a subset of OverDrive Read titles that also include professional narration, so you can read it and listen to it at the same time. This is primarily kids' books that have this format, and some of them also come with, an, over some OverDrive Read books also come with what they call a fixed layout. Again, that's going to work best on a larger screen device, but again, it's like a picture book where if you shrink the page down too much, it's not going to be very legible on a, a um, cell phone or something like that. Moving on to audiobook file formats, uh, we have currently, uh, you're going to find two uh, audiobook file formats. I think almost every audiobook we have is available in MP3 format. Uh, the MP3 format can be downloaded directly to mobile devices using the OverDrive mobile app. It can be downloaded to Windows and Mac computers using OverDrive for Windows or OverDrive for Mac software. And you can either listen to it on the computer or you can then transfer it to a little standalone MP3 player, an iPod, or um, burn it to a CD. There's also, in, in many instances, an OverDrive listen format available. And this is comparable to the OverDrive read. It lets uh, users listen to an audiobook immediately via their current web browser. Um, on either a computer or a mobile device. So again, no additional software to download or activate. The one difference between OverDrive Read and OverDrive Listen is that the OverDrive Listen, because it's a streaming service, it's not available for offline access. So you do have to be connected to the internet in order to take advantage of OverDrive Listen. And I have one more file that talks about file format. And I just want to mention this because some of you and some of your patrons may uh, remember WMA format as something that was available. Um, this file format uh, was discontinued uh, and removed from OverDrive in May 2015. When we first started uh, in 2008 purchasing audiobooks, almost every single audiobook was only available in the WMA format. A few were also avail available in MP3. WMA format audiobooks are protected by a Windows DRM. So in the beginning, um, audiobook publishers were really worried about, um, they really wanted to restrict usage. They were really afraid of their products being shared and um, you know, losing business. They thought you know, they were worried, thinking that what had happened with file sharing and music was going to happen with file sharing and audiobooks. So they really wanted to lock down their audiobook content. But that WMA, Windows DRM, made the audiobooks trickier and harder to use. For instance, WMA audiobooks couldn't be downloaded to Macs at all. They had to be downloaded to a Windows computer. They could be listened to on a Windows computer or transferred to an MP3 player, but that MP3 player had to be capable of playing protected WMA files. Most MP3 players were, but every once in a while someone would come across, somebody would have an MP3 player that wasn't capable of protecting, of playing protected WMA files. WMA files couldn't be uh, burned to CD, and they couldn't be downloaded directly to mobile devices like smartphones or tablets via the OverDrive app. So over the years, what OverDrive did is they really worked with the publishers and worked on getting more and more of them to make more and more titles available in that MP3 format, which is much easier for patrons to use and is uh, downloadable to many more devices. Eventually, they kind of got to a tipping point where they decided they were going to sort of um, they were sort of going to kind of give an ultimatum to the publishers, and they basically said, "Okay, uh, at this point, we're not going to deal with WMA anymore." Um, and when they gave that ultimatum to publishers, 
they did get some more to come on board with the MP3 format uh, for audiobooks. And then they did sort of have a drop dead date in May 2015. And uh, the publishers that only provided uh, WMA audiobooks uh, were no longer, those titles were no longer available through Overdrive. We did actually lose about a thousand titles from our collection at that point. Um, we did get some uh, credit back from Overdrive uh, to, to make up partly for that loss. Um, and so, you know, you can look at that as a negative or, or positive. We did lose some content but we also now only have MP3 audiobook format audiobooks in the collection, which is much easier to deal with, and they're much, much uh, more accessible to patrons. So overall, I think it's a positive. But I just want to, even though those aren't available anymore, many of you and many of your patrons uh, probably remember some things about the WMA audiobook. So just to be clear, that format's no longer available. Um, Quickly, um, all titles can be returned early with a few exceptions. If you download an MP3 audiobook to a Mac, those cannot be returned early. Open PDF ebooks can't be returned early. And then this final bullet point, I didn't come up with a really good way to word this. I couldn't figure out how to word this to be clear, but Basically, open EPUB eBooks can be returned early if you've downloaded them using the OverDrive app for an Android device, a Chromebook, um, an Apple device using the iOS operating system, or Windows 8 operating system. In other instances, open EPUB eBooks cannot be returned early. But again, only a small subset of our titles are available in that open EPUB format. Um, if books are not returned early by the patrons, uh, they will return themselves automatically on their due date down to the minute. And I have a little screenshot showing you, um, I think up until, uh, you know, when you've got several days left, it will say it expires in one day, expires in two days. Once you get to the specific day on which it retire, it expires, I believe you do get uh, a down to the minute uh, countdown. That's important because sometimes uh, patrons think they have the whole day. Uh, you know, they, they think, okay, well, it's due tomorrow, but I have all day to read it. Well, that may not be true. It's going to depend on what time they originally checked the book out. Um, th two weeks ago or three weeks ago, um, that's going to determine when it suddenly is no longer available in their collection. Uh, we always get the question about whether it's possible to renew titles, um, and it is not possible to renew them per se. Um, it's not called renewal, but you can, uh, as long as nobody's placed a hold on the title, you can check it out again as soon as it um, is returned or expires. One thing that I do if I know I'm not going to get a book done by the time it expires. If there are no holes on it, um, and maybe it's going to be due in two days and I know I'm not going to get it done, you know, I worry, well, what if somebody places a hold on it in the next two days and I'm not going to be able to check it out again? Sometimes I'll actually return my book early and then turn around and check it out again. So I've got it for another two or three weeks. So that's, that's uh, the way you can counsel your patrons as far as um, if they need to check the book out a second time. Okay, we are now going to move on to uh, the demo. Um, before I do that, I just want to ask, uh, does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about so far? If not, I'll go ahead then and we'll start talking about the actual Nebraska Overdrive site and how you use it. And we're a little further along in our hour than I hoped we'd be at this point, but um, I will probably, hopefully, um, I'll get most of it covered and I'll, I'll go a little long if necessary. And I hope that works out for you. So when you first, uh, you and your patrons first come to the Nebraska Overdrive Library site, you have an option. Um, your patrons can sign in right away if they want to, or, uh, they can wait until they're prompted to sign in, um, which they'll be prompted uh, 
at the time they perform an action that requires uh, you to be signed in. So once they click on a borrow uh, button, they'll be prompted to log in. If they try to place a hold on a title, they'll be prompted to log in. If they try to add a book to a wish list, they'll be prompted to log in. Uh, the primary reason to encourage patrons to sign in right away would be if your library participates in the Overdrive Advantage program. Um, the Overdrive Advantage program allows libraries to purchase uh, unique titles and additional copies of popular titles for the exclusive use of their own patrons. Um, and signing in would allow uh, patrons of those libraries to see those additional titles and copies. We have about 37 libraries in our Nebraska Overdrive Libraries group that uh, participate in the Overdrive program. And uh, you can see a list of those libraries by clicking on the, the See If Your Library Offers More Titles link. So this is a list of libraries that do participate in the Advantage program. Um, and that also explains why you'll sometimes see these little A Advantage icons. Uh, on titles. So I'm scrolling down here and you'll see under World War II fact and fiction uh, this category you see some A icons on some titles. If you hover over that it will tell you your library may offer more copies of this title. Sign in to check availability. So right now they don't know which library I'm associated with so they're seeing at least one library that's part of this consortium has purchased an additional copy. We don't know if it's your library or not. If you want to see, um, sign in. So this would be a point at which uh, you uh, could click to sign in. You're prompted to uh, select your library. It usually remembers which library you last logged in as, so it remembers that I'm logging in with a Shadron Public Library card. Um, my library card number and PIN are already uh, entered. And then I sign in. Now I've got a image of the book and if I hover over the icon now it will tell me your library has purchased additional copies of this title. Um, so that means sometimes when you're not signed in you'll uh, see a title and it will be checked out. It doesn't look like you can Nothing's available for you to check out, but once you sign in, you may find that there is an additional title, an additional copy of that title available to you through your own library to check out. Um, as far as how much Advantage uh, costs to set up an Advantage account, um, this first number is going to scare you, but this is sort of their non-promotional price, and I don't think that anybody's paid this price for a while. Their non-promotional cost to set up an Advantage account is $1,000. The positive aspect of that is that entire $1,000 is added to a library's marketplace account as a credit, and then they can spend that entire $1,000 on books. Uh, for months now, uh, Overdrive has been running a promotion, and they don't have, you know, as far as I know, they're going to continue to run it. They will give a library uh, an option or a selection of maybe six or nine books and tell the library you have to pick, you have to purchase at least three books out of this list and then uh, we'll set you up with a, a an Advantage account. And it's possible, if depending on which of the three titles you select, uh, it, they could cost under $50. So, um, so it doesn't with the promotions going on, it doesn't cost a lot of money to sign up for an Advantage account, but that does mean you're going to have to um, be responsible for doing some of your own collection development for any titles you'd want to make available to your own patrons. Um, so anyway, um, I just want to mention that so that you'll understand uh, if you are an Advantage library, why you want to encourage your patrons to sign in right away. For those of you who aren't an Advantage library, it explains why you've got those little A uh, icons on the covers of some books. So what I really want to focus on now is how you can help your patrons navigate the Overdrive website in order to identify titles to check out. Um, you have a number of options as far as um, searching or browsing for titles. There's a basic search box up here 
at the top of the screen where you can type in keywords uh, from the author or the title or subject of the book. There's an advanced search screen you can go to, and then there's also a number of browse options. Uh, on the main screen, um, front and center today, this just showed up today, uh, we are currently in a two-week period where they have a big library read promotion where um, all of our patrons have unlimited access to uh, the book, and this is where it ends. And so that's showing up right on top of our screen today. Normally, the first thing your patrons would see on their screen would be the new ebooks category. Um, below the new ebooks category, there's a new audiobooks category. In both of these cases, these are uh, invitations for patrons to browse. In both cases, these are format specific. Um, if you continue to scroll down, you'll see a new releases category. And in this particular case, this is not format specific. So you've got a combination of ebooks and audiobooks. Um, at this point, I want to point out in the upper right hand corner of each book cover image, you will see a format type indicator. So in the first line of new releases, uh, you've got five books uh, f that have the um, book image icon in the upper right hand corner. Those are ebooks. The last uh, book in the row, Avid Reader, uh, that format icon is a headset and that indicates that's an audio book. Um, we've got a special collection that we set up at one point with World War II fact and fiction and then um, another category down here lost in the virtual stacks which tries to uh, get people to check out titles that haven't been checked out as much. You also up at the top of the screen have additional ebook categories you can search and these categories can always be toggled on or off using this menu icon so it can be turned off or it can be turned on depending. What happens most often is, um, and it's just human nature, the first category that people see on the screen when they come to this website, they see the new ebooks. And so what's going to happen most often is your patrons are going to start looking at new ebooks. Uh, there are 12 new ebooks displayed on the screen, and then there's a view more a link that you can click on to see additional titles. And this is really what I think most patrons start doing. Um, one thing that I want to point out, um, in the past when you selected one of these categories like new ebooks, all you saw, you saw basically 200 titles. They, they capped the, dis, the um, result list of 200 titles. Now they actually show you all the titles in the collection all the ebooks in the collection, but they have sorted it by date added to site. So the titles that have been most recently added to the site are going to show up first. So we've got a result list. Uh, we have 24 uh, titles displayed on this result list. Up at the top, we have this number that tells us we have 885, excuse me, pages of results. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you get actual number of titles. So on this page, you're viewing 1 through 24 out of 21,226 ebooks. So this is a good place to get uh, a, just a number. If you want to know how many ebooks are in our collection, um, there's 21,226 unique ebook titles available in our collection. Um, I will point out on this screen the other important piece of information to be aware of on this, uh, if you look at that format type indicator icon in the upper corner of each screen, not only does it tell you that these are all ebooks, but you can also see in some cases that book icon is grayed out, and that tells you that those particular titles are checked out. So um, in this, uh, this row right here, uh, you've got three out of four titles checked out. Um, this row right here, all four titles are checked out. And this is probably one of the biggest uh, 
complaints or stumbling blocks patrons have when using this service. And I've had several uh, librarians talk to me about this recently. A patron will start browsing and it, it will seem like every single title is checked out to them almost. So, you know, you're scrolling through this list, checked out, checked out, checked out, checked out, checked out. You know, here's one that's available, but it looks like it's a kid's title. You know, they'll go through page after page and they'll complain that almost everything is checked out. Um, the best way to deal with that is if you come over here on the left where we've got um, filters, uh, you'll see we're already filtering to just ebooks because we selected the new ebook category, but you also have the option of viewing all titles or titles that are available now. This is hugely important uh, to share with your patrons. If they uh, want to just look at titles that they can currently check out right away without having to place a hold, have them click on available now. And that filters out all the titles that are already checked out. If you scroll down to the bottom of the, of the screen, you'll see we went from 21,000 titles total in the collection ebooks to 13,635 ebooks that are available to check out right now. And so the patrons will have a much more positive browsing experience if they're only viewing titles that are available. Um, I ran the numbers and the numbers uh, indicate we've got about 60% of the ebook collection is available to check out, 40% is checked out currently. Um, and one thing to think about, this really brings up to mind the difference between a physical collection and a virtual collection. Um, you probably have a fairly large percentage of your actual physical collection that's checked out at any one time, but when patrons come in and browse the shelves, they only see the titles that are currently available for them to check out. They don't see all the titles that aren't on the shelves because they're in someone's home. So um, training your patrons in how to toggle between all titles and titles that are available now gets them back into that experience that they're more used to in the physical library so, um, so that they're only looking at titles that they can actually check out and quote, take with them, unquote, today. Um, for now, I'm going to go back to all titles. Um, sort of the default uh, resultless display is cover images only. You can get a lot of information from the cover image. You can see, as we said, using that icon in the upper right hand corner of the book, whether it's an ebook or audiobook, whether it's currently available or checked out. You get the title of the book, the author of the book. If you hover your uh, mouse icon over the book title, you will have an option to either place a hold uh, or if a book is available to check out, uh, you have the option of borrowing it. You also have the option of reading a sample of the book. You can add a title to your wish list. Um, and you'll see I already added this title to the wish list associated with this account. Um, I can remove the title from my wish list or add it again. You can share information about the book using social media. Um, sometimes I'll email uh, the title of a book to a friend if I just want them to know, hey, this book's available, you might like it. If you like to post to social media like Facebook or Twitter about what you're reading, um, this is a good way to get that post started with information and a cover image of the book. Um, if you want more information about the book, you can click on the more icon right here and that will take you to the detailed record for the book. Um, before we look at the detailed record, I want to go back and I just want to show you this other uh, result list display option because some of your patrons may like it better. Um, you can do a list option. It gives you the same information plus a little additional information that you don't see when you're just viewing cover images. You again get the icon showing whether an item's available or checked out. You have the title and the author, but you also get series information. So for example, Bridget Jones' Baby is part of a series and it's book four in the series. That's information you don't see by the other display. You'll also see information about how many copies of the title are owned by uh, the consortium or are, or are available to you. 
uh, and how many people are on the waiting list. So uh, it looks like available copies, zero of one. So that tells you the consortium owns one copy of this title and that one copy is not available because it's currently checked out. Not only is it checked out, but there's one person on the waiting list. So you would have the option of placing a hold and you would be the second person on the waiting list. You also get uh, about three sentences from the synopsis of the book. So uh, sometimes it's nice to see that synopsis and not just the cover image, depending. So again, some of you, some of your pa patrons might like this display better. And so I just want to point out that that's an option. As far as then going into the detailed view for a particular title, I'm going to go ahead and go down here and go into the other boy. Um, you can either click on the title itself or, as I said, click on this little more icon. Uh, clicking both of those places will get you to the detailed record for this book. And there is important information on this screen. Um, it's tempting sometimes to just uh, click on the borrow icon at this point and borrow the book. And in some cases, that's going to be fine. It's not going to be a problem. But in other cases, depending on what uh, limitations your patrons might have in terms of the type of format uh, they can handle. Um, it may make more sense to direct them, them to this screen. So important information on the screen, it tells you exactly what formats, what ebook file formats this book is available in. So when you check this book out, you'll be able to have it delivered in Kindle format. So if your patrons own a Kindle e-reader and they have to have it available in Kindle format, they know that they can check this book out. It's available in that OverDrive read option, which can be read directly from an uh, up-to-date browser, and it's available in EPUB ebook format. Um, you also, again, have information about how many copies are owned and how many of those copies are available. You have a synopsis of the book that you can read. Um, you can expand the synopsis by clicking on the down arrow. Uh, Overdrive tries to recommend similar titles for you. If you scroll down the page, in some cases you have uh, review excerpts. You have title information. I'm going to expand that. This will give you the publisher. So I know that this book is available from HarperCollins, and so um, I know that it's only available uh, 26 for 26 checkouts. That's just something that your patrons won't necessarily know, but I know. So I'm actually going to not check this out after all. It tells you the release date. Finally, there's some digital rights uh, information. It just tells the patron about um, copyright. So as I said, now that I know that this title is available for 26 checkouts, I'm not going to waste any of those checkouts. Uh, <laughs> on our training session. So let me just find another uh, title to actually go through the checkout process for Permanent Sunset. Let's try this one. Um, this one, it looks like it is uh, checked out already. So I'm going to go ahead and place a hold on this title. When I go to place a hold, um, it will ask me to enter an email address so that I can get notified when this title is available. Um, because I've used this account before, it's already stored my email address, but I could change it if I wanted the email notification go to, to go to a different email address. I also have the option to say I automatically borrow this title when it becomes available if I want it to be checked out to me immediately. If I turn this option off, I'll get a notice when the book is available for me to check out, and then I'll have three days in which to check it out before it moves on to the next person on the hold list. So I usually go ahead, and your patrons probably will want to have that automatic borrow option on. So I'm going to place a hold on this title. And I'll go back to browsing, and I want to go ahead and check out a title that's available. And let's go ahead and display new ebooks again. And we talked a little bit about having to, uh, trying to make sure that a book's available in a particular format for a patron. If your patron can only handle Kindle uh, format ebooks, they may at this point want to limit their uh, display to just Kindle ebooks. Um, and just to show you, 
so you can get a sense of how many of the titles are available in Kindle format. We've got 21,000 titles total. When I use this filter on the left and say limit to Kindle books, I can scroll down to the bottom and you can see I've got 17,400. So between three and 4,000 books are not available in Kindle format, but the majority are. So let me go ahead and go in here, just find a book that's available. And uh, Simon & Schuster is available for one year, so I'm not going to be using up one of our checkouts. So I'm going to go ahead and borrow this title. Um, it is checked out to me. It tells me I still have uh, five checkouts remaining from my total of six checkouts. And I have the option of going to my checkouts page or returning the title. Um, before we go to the checkouts page, I want to do a check out a couple more titles quickly. I'm going to go ahead and go back to uh, the main Nebraska Overdrive Libraries page. And this time I want to check out an audiobook. So I'm going to go ahead and browse one of these audiobook categories. So I'm going to say I want audiobook nonfiction, and I'm going to do all nonfiction. Um, here's a book available on the screen, uh, front and center, The Boy Who Runs. So I'm going to go ahead and view the uh, detailed record page for this device. And a couple things that you want uh, to be aware of on the screen for audiobooks. This will tell you whether the edition is abridged or unabridged. As a rule, we try never to purchase abridged audiobooks because most patrons, if they find out an audiobook is abridged, they're not interested. Um, so sometimes there are titles that our patrons are interested in, but we can only get it in abridged format through Overdrive. And so that might be a case where we don't purchase a title that you'd think we would want to purchase. But in this case, it does confirm it's unabridged. Um, I want to scroll down, though, here. Um, and I want to take you to the title information for an audiobook. This information is sometimes helpful for the patron, and it's sometimes helpful for you if you're trying to troubleshoot with a patron. One of the thing, one of the pieces of information you get under the title information is how long the audiobook is, which is information that patrons sometimes want to know. It also tells you the number of parts, so eight parts. So when a patron is downloading a title, sometimes they may think that they're missing a part. Um, this can confirm and let you see why, uh, how many parts should be downloaded if they want the complete book. Um, and let me see, I've got a couple questions over here to the right. Uh, one person asks, will these slides be available to read later? And um, yes, they will be. And also, um, another question, if a patron has a Kindle as their e-reader, does this mean that they can check out only the Kindle format? In other words, can a patron check out an EPUB ebook for reading on their Kindle device? Um, that's a good question, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in the session that we have two weeks from now, or we'll kind of go through some examples so you can see. If they've got what I would call a Kindle e-reader, like the black and white, uh, like uh, the Kindle um, paper white, they, ha they can only read Kindle format books on those Kindle e-readers. The exception is if they have a Kindle Fire, the Kindle of Fire is, uh, I consider it more like a tablet, so it's like an iPad. They can send Kindle Fire, ver they can send Kindle ver formats of books to their Kindle Fire, but they can also download the OverDrive app on their Kindle Fire, and so then they can download both the EPUB eBooks and MP3 audiobooks using the OverDrive app. So the Kindle Fire is flexible and allows multiple formats. If they've got the Kindle e-reader, then they're limited to the Kindle format. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and borrow this audiobook. 
And uh, I can go to checkouts from right here, but I also just want to show you the uh, other way you can get to the checkout page. Um, and that is if you go to your patron's account. So clicking on the account icon will take you to uh, the account options. The first screen that you see is the checkout screen. And so you'll see the two books that uh, we have checked out here. And I'm not going to do anything more with these books at, during this session because that's what we're going to talk about in two weeks when we actually talk about the process of downloading ebooks and audiobooks. Um, you will notice in both these cases, because I have not downloaded the books yet, I haven't selected a format yet, um, I still have the option of returning these titles right now. Um, you'll see in the case of the ebook, it says download select one format. And you'll remember this ebook was available in several formats. So you can see I can choose either the Kindle format if I have to have the Kindle version of the ebook, or I can select the EPUB ebook. Um, once I select one of those formats and download the title, then I will no longer be able to return the title from this screen. Um, but again, I'll be able to return it from the software I downloaded to, and we'll talk about that and give examples next week or two weeks from now. Other information you can get from uh, the account area of the OverDrive site. Uh, it does give you kind of a running count of your checkouts. So it tells you and reminds you, you can check out six titles. You currently have two titles checked out. There's a limit of uh, three holes that can be placed, and there are two titles on hold already. It also talks about items added to your wish list and tells you how many of those wish list items are available now. So let's go ahead and look at some of those other screens in under my account. One is the hold screen. So um, this is the uh, permanent sunset is the title I just put on hold. Date added 1013. Uh, this other title I put on hold uh, about a week ago. Um, information that is important on these screens. It tells me that auto checkout is on. So that means as soon as uh, the book becomes available to me, it will be checked out to me. Uh, if I click on that on link, I have the option of turning that off if I don't want it automatically checked out to me. This also gives a little bit more explicit information about where your patron is in the hold list because this is something that confuses patrons sometimes. They'll, they'll think they're next in line for the book, but they're actually, um, there's one person ahead of them in the hold list. And so this tells me you are next in line for this title. So that means I'm number one on the hold list. For this other book, it says hold position one person ahead of you. So this is one person, one additional person has a hold on this title ahead of me, and that's not the person that has it currently checked out. If you click on the little question mark, it spells that out a little bit further. It says, total holds five, your holds position number two on one copy. There is at most one person ahead of you in line for this title. So it's currently checked out to patron A. Patron B is first in line for the whole, first in the hold line, I'm patron C and I'm second on the hold list. So sometimes if your patrons are confused about where they're at, coming to the screen and really reading the text and clicking on the little question mark helps spell that out for them. Uh, under options, this is where you can come and if they need to edit the email address that notification is going to go to, they can do that here. There's also a nice option to suspend a hold. Maybe they know that um, they're about to get the hold, the hold, they're, they're tied, the, they're, you know, sometime within the next week, the book's going to be automatically checked out to them and they know they're too busy and they're not going to read it. They can suspend their hold for from seven to 90 days. They have several increments they can choose. So that's a nice option if they're trying to manage their reading. Um, they can remove the hold, or again, they can turn that auto checkout on or off. So those are options available to them to manage their holds. If they come over to lists, this is where they can see titles that they've added to their wish list, titles they have rated, which I didn't really talk about yet. And then um, if you've got current 
titles checked out, sometimes OverDrive will recommend titles for you. One thing that's nice, and this is something you can offer to your patrons, um, since patrons can only place three titles on hold at a time, um, the other thing they can do if there's titles that they're interested in is they can add them to their wish list. Um, in this case, I have nine titles added to the wish list. And then there's always the option of seeing what titles are available now. So maybe they already have three titles on hold, but there are other titles they know they're going to want to read at some point, and they, but they don't want to cancel a hold and put a hold on the new title. They can add them to their wish, li wish list and then periodically come to the screen and just check to see which of those titles are currently available to check out. So that's a way for patrons to add titles to a list to remember to books they want to come back to. Um, people often ask, is there a way that I can uh, get a list of all the titles I've checked out? Um, there's not always uh, a good way to do that, but one thing that I would suggest to people is if they want to keep uh, track within their account is once they read a book, um, I'm going to go in here they can add a rating, so they can add a certain number of stars. If they always add a rating to a book after they read it, they'll be able to go back to their list, so account, lists, and then they can see rated titles. So, so if they always rate every title they read, that would be one way to keep a list of all the titles they've read. Um, finally, I want to point out settings. Um, for their account, and this is probably a screen that not a lot of patrons uh, drill their way down to, but it does have some important settings. This is where a patron can change their own checkout defaults for how long a title is going to be checked out. As I said, if a patron doesn't change their defaults, the default checkout, um, if they check out without thinking about it, the default checkout is 14 days for ebooks and 14 days for audiobooks. Um, if they know that they uh, only want to check an audiobook out for seven days, they can switch their default to seven days. They can also uh, switch their ebook checkout default to seven days or 21 days. So I know for me, I know it always takes me a while, so I've got my default set to 21 days for ebooks. So that's where the patron can change their own default. There's also a maturity levels option, and this has actually caused some odd problems that are a little bit hard to troubleshoot. Um, some patrons have come in to this uh, screen and they think, well, they're adults, and so they select. For some reason, they've gotten their settings set to limit, their, to limit the titles they see to mature adult to mature adult. Um, and then what usually happens is they go ahead and they do a search or browse, and they get hardly any titles or no titles at all. So they'll come here and they'll say, I want to see ebook fiction um, horror category. And they only get one title, and then they'll say, I know there's more titles than that. Um, then maybe the librarian will log into her account and do a search, the same search, the same browse, and she'll get lots more titles, and they'll say, why can't I only see this one book? Um, the couple times that's happened, um, you know, when I, when I see that happening and they're not getting very many titles, uh, one thing to do is go check and see if they've got some sort of uh, maturity level limiter set. Um, mature adult title is actually, basically, I think it, it's tagged to the erotic literature subject heading, and so all they're getting are titles that have that subject heading erotic literature. So usually that's not what people are wanting to limit their searches to. So once you go back to juvenile to mature adult, go back and do your browse for horror titles again, and now you've got 275 titles. So that's just sort of a tip for troubleshooting if people are getting uh, fewer titles than they would expect. And other settings we don't have as many problems with. You can block mature adult book covers if you want. There's a high contrast uh, display option that may help people who have visual problems. Uh, and then there's also a dyslexic font that you can turn on that 
dyslexic font is just on the website itself. It doesn't apply to the text of the books per se. So those are the other two setting options in the settings screen. Um, I think, I don't see any other questions. Uh, that kind of gets me, I think, to the end of what I wanted to cover in today's session. Uh, do you guys have questions uh, before we sign off for today's session? Um, finally, I'll just say, in case some of you may have logged on after, uh, after I did my little introduction spiel, if you are uh, logged in, I should be able to see you. If you have additional people attending with you uh, that don't show up on the, the login uh, display that I've got, if you've got other people attending that didn't go through the login process, just type their name in the question box and send it to me and I'll make sure that uh, they also get recorded as attending this session. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions for me, that, that's all I have uh, today. Um, how to access your slides. Um, why don't I go ahead, I can send them by email to the people who attended today, and then also I will be putting up um, the recording for this session on uh, our website, and I'll send out information when that's available over the Nebraska Overdrive mailing list. Um, so yeah, this recording will be available so that people can watch it who weren't able to attend today. Any other questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the question box. Let's see, I'm just scrolling to make sure I didn't miss any questions. I think I've got them all. Okay, um, well, like I said, I'll make these ava this available, the recording and the slides, and I hope um, if you're interested, you can join me in two weeks when we actually pick up from here and actually talk about downloading uh, and the software you need to download in different situations. But again, if you can't attend in two weeks, I'll record that session as well and put it up. So hope everyone has a great weekend, and I will be in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs>